Well, my talk today, uh, I hope, is provocative, um, and that is higher education adopt or die. But to be truthful, I think what I'm going to say today isn't that controversial. I think most of us who really are honest and have been paying attention know that uh, higher education uh, is in dire need of change. But all the talks that I've seen and the, the, the you know, interactions have been amazing, and it's, a, it's, really, it's wonderful to be around people like you, innovative and motivated. So before I start, I want to make two quick qualifications. The first is I am not claiming in this talk that all universities and colleges are endangered species. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Harvards, the Princetons, the Stanfords of the world are going to be OK regardless of what I say. But I am saying that the system of higher education as we know it is broken, and it is not sustainable, nor in my view is it scalable at this point. I also want to point out that my remarks are going to be uh, purposely limited to the United States. Um, I think if we had to talk about global higher education, it would be different. Um, I think there's a lot of innovation and collaboration going on out of necessity, but we're here in the United States, and I think it's actually critical to look at what's going on in this country and also the extent to which higher education, and actually P through 20 in general, can make a major impact on what we really need to do in order to actually move in the right direction. So, without further ado, I'm going to give you five sort of David Letterman list type reasons why higher education either adapts or it dies. And, and if you laugh at any of them, it wasn't my doing, it's not purposeful, and I probably did the wrong thing. So, number one, no longer is higher education the dynamic primary knowledge producer, sort of pushing the envelope in terms of the needs of society, in terms of innovation, in terms of the extent to which we can uh, really react to what's going on in the world. And I mean, if you think about this, this is not a very controversial statement. I mean, the reality is, if you look at some of the iconic figures that we associate with innovation and social change, whether you agree or not, Bill Gates, for example, does he have a higher ed degree? No, he does not, and he's very proud to, to remind us all the time of that fact. If you think about the founder of Facebook, um, you could argue that his success came despite the interventions of the university that he's associated with and that he graduated from. So, I mean, the reality is we are no longer looked as we were in the early part of the 20th century as the primary producers of knowledge. Ironically, in number two, we're not really looked as the primary producers of practical education because often our graduates don't have the kind of practical experience they need when they go onto the labor market. So we're not particularly good at providing practical education either. Number three, the traditions of higher education, and by this I really mean tenure, specialization around areas of expertise, um, ob objectivity and the rules and, uh, related to scholarship and research, all of that seems at odds with the 20th, 21st century. I mean, if you think about the way that people now access knowledge and information, they don't do it according to sort of the Britannica rules of engagement in terms of scholarship and research. Wiki, you know, blogs, et cetera, really undermine things that we, can, we associate with objectivity. Think about the field of journalism, for example. And also, the reality is the social problems in this time, in this world, are not only to a degree intractable, they're intertwined, they're mutating constantly. And as a result, if you think about the way that higher education is being structured, the reality is that they're very tunneled in terms of uh, you know, categories and disciplines. And when the problems that are emerging are connected, I mean, think about HIV and AIDS, the, pa the pandemic. Think about how connected it is to so many social issues. How are you going to somehow separate that and look at one component of it? So the traditions are out of odds. That's third. Fourth, there's a massive demographic shift in this country. And I'm mean, not telling anyone who lives in this state. I mean, California is now a minority majority state. Texas, New York, Florida are soon to follow. And you know, there's a tipping point going on. And the reality is that the country doesn't look the way it did um, 50 years ago. And for some of that, for us, that's a good thing. But the reality for other folks, they're actually quite threatened by that. And then the other part of it is that the demographics are changing. And by that, I mean race, ethnicity, language. I also mean age. I think age is actually a really critical one. And the reality is that higher education institutions are not capable of providing uniformly excellent and affordable higher ed opportunities. Again, I don't think I'm saying anything 
controversial year, or even that provocative. I'm just telling the truth the way I see it. And I think probably the last reason, the fifth reason, is that financially, it's, it's no longer a sustainable system. I mean, if you think about higher education as an industry, and you look at it from the point of view of the rising expenses, and the only way to cover those rising expenses is to continue to pass on the burden of the cost onto the consumer, that is not a recipe for a successful business. I mean, the whole point of mass production was that it actually lowered the cost of products that we wanted to consume, not increase them. Well, higher education has done the opposite. So if we're all in agreement that higher education needs to change, why haven't we done anything about it? Well, I think there are three fundamental obstacles that make it difficult for higher education to change. I think the first is the system itself is antiquated. It's based on a mode of organization stemming and really from the Enlightenment philosophy days. I know that sounds fancy, but it's really a way of saying that we thought about knowledge as compartmentalized and specialized, and we had to be experts in these areas, and they had to be valid, and they had to be rigorous. And the reality is that there's a blurring going on in the 21st century, and it's been going on for a long time, that really makes these Enlightenment principles problematic. And if you think about that in terms of this sort of stagnation or, or segregation of ideas and knowledge, when we're talking about innovation and collaboration, as we've been talking about the whole time that we've been here, really that kind of mode does not lend itself towards innovation and collaboration. The second major obstacle is that there's just the rapid uh, rate of innovation and, and technological change in society. There's no way a mammoth uh, bureaucracy like higher education could keep up with it. It would be sort of the height of hubris to assume that we could keep up with the changes that are going on, and yet we keep on trying to. And then finally, new competitors. Um, I remember this, and I think probably Lisa, you'll remember this. Lisa and I were subject to the worst seminar in the history of seminars. And uh, a former president of, a, I won't say of the institution, because he's passed away, said only one profound thing in the 12 seminars we were in. He said, uh, Business seeps into the cracks of dysfunctional public systems. And I thought, good God, he's right. They do. Now, he meant it in a really good way. All right. And we were a little concerned, I think, Lisa and I, because the reality is we want innovation. We want systems to change. But if you think about that description, the idea that businesses or the private sector seep into these cracks, do they seep in them to? to provide glue, or do they seep in them to actually deepen the cracks? So the reality for me is new competitors are a good thing, and I'm all for competition, and in fact, I'll talk about partnership and competition towards the end of the talk. But the reality is the competitors have to be working collaboratively together. If they're not, then we have a problem, because the fundamental public mission of higher education is around, you heard it already, democratic citizenship. We can argue about whether we do it or not, but I don't think any of us here would argue that it is an important, an important aspect of what higher education does. So I know that so far I've kind of painted a gloomy picture, but I actually am a firm believer in uh, every challenge being an opportunity. And so for example, I think actually the greatest opportunity now is that there's a need and an overwhelming demand for quality higher education. It's never been greater. I mean, it's connected to the demographic shift in this country. It's connected to the fact that people can't afford to get a good quality education in this country. And as a result, I think this is an opportunity for us. And actually, if you look, there's a mounting pressure that's emerging around providing affordable higher ed. You can actually see it in the Occupy movements uh, that are occurring across the country, and you can see it in the response of the federal government. Um, Secretary of Education uh, Arne Duncan said that uh, providing affordable edu higher education is, a, is a paramount, of a paramount importance to, to the federal government and to the nation. Uh, President Obama just recently talked about new federal guidelines to diversify the student bodies in higher education. So there's an awareness and I think a pressure that's building around providing affordable quality higher ed. However, before I talk about some of these possibilities, I think I need to say something, uh, basically state my own bias. I don't believe there is a magic pill to solve anything. I don't believe there's a magic pill to solve what ails higher education. Right. I think often now, when you talk about P through 20 ed, um, technology is often used as the way to solve whatever is actually wrong with what's going on throughout the system. And I'm a firm believer in the way that technology can improve the overall educational experience for students, 
for communities, for teachers, for administrators. But the reality is wonderful technology coupled with bad teaching, it's still bad teaching, okay? So um, I don't believe, and in, way, in some ways I actually uh, like uh, Joel's comment, which was a bunch of small ideas uh, might result in a big idea. And so I'm going to give you some small ideas, although I think they're fairly radical, but I'm kind of nerdy, so I think things are radical. I think toothpaste is radical. So the first, and I, and I find this ironic, is that higher education might be the worst learning community in the history of learning communities. <laughs> now, don't you think that's ridiculous? I mean, we have all of these experts in all of these fields, and we don't learn a damn thing about what we do. If, you, you, if I talk to my faculty, and I have, I have a relatively small faculty of about 40, 50, and ask, what is your colleague doing? They don't have a clue, all right? So we don't learn anything, and I think that's really terrible. But the biggest, I think, tragedy about not learning from each other is that we don't even utilize the assets that are in our hands, that are actually based on our expertise. So if you think about it, assessment should be something that we in higher education lead. We should be the leaders of assessment. And I don't mean it in a wonky accountability way. I mean around learning income, uh, outcomes, around the capacity to take all the disciplines that we have embedded in higher education and create really strong learning outcomes, metrics by which we can be able to say to students, this is the value added we give for you to be here, for you to pay all of this money. And we've not done that, but there's a capacity to do it, and I think that's some, actually something that's very exciting, at least for me. You know, and the thing is that we need to determine what our assets are in higher education, and I think this is a real critical piece, meaning that um, I read in the New York Times recently that uh, a number of people are calling for the uh, uh, dissolution of um, the um, Postal Service. And, and I think that's an interesting idea. Um, but the reality is I would like to know what infrastructural assets does the Postal Service have that we might be able to use in a different way. So before we throw out um, the Postal Service or before we throw out higher education, what are the assets that we have in place that community-based organizations don't have that we could lend? But it would require us to have a little more humility and to think about what we do well and what we don't do well. So for example, I don't think, and I'm, in a, I'm a dean of a college of ed, I don't think any university should run a K through 12 school. I don't think it's a very good idea, all right? And I think that that's an example of a partnership that doesn't work well because we haven't thought about what we do exceptionally well and what we don't, and what others do exceptionally well. So I know that Lisa wanted me to talk about the K through 12 linkage, and I, I really feel that the, the way to scale up higher education is in partnership with other organizations and entities. I think one of the primary partnerships is K through 12. And I would tell you that K through 12 environments and higher ed environments are inextricably linked in a way now that actually policy is pushing us. So we really have no choice. So whether we like it or not, you know there was a discussion in the Action Collab about um, uh, an identifier or the extent to which you'll be able to identify teachers to student achievement data and it's all standardized. I'm in Colorado, that's happening right now. So there are teacher identifiers. Each teacher has an identification number and that identification number will be attached to student achievement data as well as attached to where they graduate from. So we really don't have a choice but to think about partnering with our K through 12 um, environments in a way that we haven't before. The private sector, and I said that I think competition is a good thing. I think the private sector is a place in which we really need to partner, but we need to partner in a way where we're clear about what our values are and what their values are and how we can have mutual benefit and how the logics of our organizations can, can sustain each other, even in competition, without undermining. Because partnerships are very difficult. I, I have a number of partnerships in our college involving districts and private entities, and they're very difficult to actually run. So I want to say one last thing, and then I will stop. Um, the, the thing that I think we've done really poorly is we haven't actually identified what it is we do. Again, I'm going to refer to Joel. He talked about, well, what, is, what does a school do? Well, what do, what do universities and colleges do? And I think if you've actually looked at the Penn State scandal, they don't do a lot of things really well. I mean, if you think about it, the branding of Penn State, ethics, leadership, if, has there not been a more fundamental failure in terms of moral leadership than occurred in Penn State? And so the reality for me is we have to think about and make a commitment to critical analytical thinking, ethics, preparation of leaders. We have to restate that mission, and then we have to dev devise curriculum that address that mission. 
And I think that can be done if we engage the faculty in a way, and I'll, and I'll just uh, reference Adora. I think you're absolutely right. Teachers and faculty care about their subject matter, and if they're good, they care about their students. And the way to actually get them to collaborate is to start small, to talk about what they care about, and then to say that it's not enough to care about it on your own. You have to have a veritable orgy of caring in which other colleagues have to contribute value. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you very much.